Well, let's start with the verse and the language. And um, the uh, so this poem is written by. This is one of the remarkable things about medieval art, right? We have masterpieces of um, uh, literature, painting, sculpture, and we don't know who is the author or the painter or the sculptor. The idea that you were some kind of hero because you were an artist and you needed to have your name plastered over everything was, you know, uh, um, not uh, uh, not universal, let's put it that way, right. right? I mean, Dante certainly wanted to be known throughout the Christian world, um, but others just never bothered with it. And right. we have um, four, possibly five, poems by this poet from the West Midlands in England. We don't know who he was. He's roughly contemporary with Geoffrey Chaucer, so we're talking about the middle to later part of the 1300s in England, okay? So late 14th century England. Um, he's probably a, a, a priest um, associated with some um, uh, court, okay? Because in these times, you know, you, you could be a courtier, but not at the royal court, right? Um, this is the medieval, medieval age was a time of decentralization, and um, the centers of power and culture all over the place. And um, so uh, th this could be a, a priest associated with a, with a duke, um, not the king. And he's, um, he's writing, he's he, like Chaucer, he's read everything that there is to read in the other modern languages, such as French and Italian. Okay, especially French and Italian. He's read. He's read Dante. This poet has read Dante. Okay, hmm. um, and of course he's fluent in Latin. There's the, no 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 doubt about that. So he's got all the learning. Um, but he's writing in an English that is more conservative than the English in London. The English in London is is more. Uh, how should we put it? Frenchified. All right. Um, because for for several centuries, the the language that was spoken by the courtiers at court uh, in London was French, Norman French. Um, anyhow, so uh, sometime or other in the 1300s, in this part of England especially, uh, not only this part, but especially this part with the West Midlands, there was what, what uh, scholars have called an alliterative, alliterative revival. Um, see, back in Anglo-Saxon days, before the Norman Conquest, what we call Old English, poetry was written in a kind of front-end rhyme. That is, you had uh, half lines alliterating important words with important words in each other, right? So if you started the half line, with the sound of a g in important words, carry it over to the second half line with a g, okay? Um, and these, these are these. This is a way of rhyming on the opening of a word rather than on the end. Um, right. Now the Romance languages didn't work that way at all. Okay, it's much easier in the Romance languages to rhyme on the end of the word, because um, Romance languages have all kinds of uh, suffixes that you know, are common because they attach to the verb and English was losing most of those. But in any case, um, uh, the, the, so the habit in English of rhyming on the back end of the word, right, uh, came to us through the Romance languages, through French and Italian. Um, but these people a little bit further removed said, oh, why don't we write some poetry in the way that they used to? It never quite died out. And so we have some geniuses, and this is one genius. This guy is as great a poet, although uh, we don't have as much from him. Um, he's as great a poet as Chaucer is. And we're talking about uh, first rank, world class. Okay? Um, and so he writes this crazy poem, uh, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, um, using... The legends that surrounded King Arthur, those had spread all across Europe, right? Wherever you go in Europe, you're going to find people singing about King Arthur uh, and Lancelot and Guinevere. It's, 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 it's universal now, okay? Um, but uh, he's going to tell a funny kind of story 
um, because he's a priest, it, he's got a moral and uh, theological uh, aim to him, right? I, I should explain to the people what the deal is, right? You're, you're there on New Year's Day, okay? You're celebrating um, during Christmas tide. It's the Feast of the Circumcision, okay? It's a major feast. Um, everybody there is celebrating. There, there's songs. There's gift giving. There's there's love making. That is people flirting, falling in love, um, and all at once, uh, the, because you can't eat. One of the rules is you can't eat unless there's an adventure. But all at once, this fellow barges into the castle. He's enormous, a big barrel-chested guy with a slender waist, brawny arms, and he's all green on a green horse and he looks around and he says where's the king here i've got a game to play he's got an axe with a handle that's about three or four feet long all right and the game is a simple one i'll give you my axe and he says i'm just here for merriment i'm here for a game you don't have to worry about me if i was here to make war. Now, then you'd be in trouble, okay? Because I see a lot of puny people out there. I don't see any match for me. But I'm here for a game. It's just a little New Year's Day game. Um, one of you come on up here and give me a blow with this axe. You get one free chop on condition that exactly one year from this day, you get the same from me in return. Now, of course, that axe should go right through anybody's head, in which case you wouldn't have to worry about what happened, one, what was going to happen a year later, right? There's not going to be a green knight um, to exact the, um, um, you know, the, the payment, right? But the guy is all green. Something's up, okay? He's not an ordinary guy. Um, and when he makes the challenge, none of the great bold knights of the round table willing to take him up on it. They're all, they're all uh, looking at each other and hesitating. And Arthur finally says, oh, it's an embarrassment to Arthur that nobody comes. So Arthur is about to do it. And that's when Gawain says, no, 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 no. Uncle Gawain is Arthur's nephew. Gawain says, let me do this. Let me do this. I'm the least here. You'll miss me the least. I'll do this, right? Um, and so the, that's basically the setup of the whole poem. And this is a poem about, well, this is a poem about grace, um, about uh, the imperfections of man, um, uh, uh, about uh, original sin. Uh, it's and you think you think it could be about none of those things. It's about a crazy story about a green knight who shows up with a right. big axe, right? Well, you've done a great job uh, introducing it, and that's a you know about as dramatic an opening to a narrative poem as you could get, really. Right. Um, so, do, do, do your readers want to hear? Your readers, your uh, our audience here want to hear um, what it sounds like in English when the Green Knight first shows up. Sure, that'd be great. Okay, Thank so you. this is this is what it is in English, a modern English translation. Okay, I'm reading the for I first I'll do the translation, then I'll do the Middle English, right? So you'll know what sound you'll know what it is that I'm talking about, right? Before I read it in the original. Um. Of the service itself, I need say no more. So the translator here, Marie Boroff, is attempting to alliterate all the lines, right? You get, you get uh, a, a running alliteration of important words in each line. For well you will know, no tittle was wanting. Another noise and new was well nigh at hand, that the Lord might have leave his life to nourish. For scarce were the sweet strains still in the hall, and the first course come to that company fair. There hurdles in at the hall door an unknown writer, one the greatest on ground in growth of his frame. From broad neck to buttocks so bulky and thick, and his loins and his legs so long and so great, 
half a giant on earth I hold him to be, but believe him no less than the largest of men, and that the seemliest in his stature to see as he rides, for in back and in breast though his body was grim, his waist and its width was worthily small, and formed with every feature and fair accord was he. Great wonder grew in hall, and his hue most strange to see, for man in gear and all, where green as green could be. Um, this form of the uh, alliterative poem employs what's called a bob and wheel. So when you alliterate a whole bunch of lines together and you want to close off the stanza, you close it off with a little uh, two-syllable bob and then a four-line rhyming wheel. Okay, There are um, exactly 101 stanzas in this poem. Could you um could you reread the last line alliterative line and then the bob and wheel just so people can know exactly what you're referring to there uh, from, from what you just read? Well, yeah, okay. So this is from the translation, right? Um, and formed with every feature in fair accord. Now comes the bob. Was he? This is the what's called the wheel. Great wonder grew in hall at his hue most strange to see for man and gear and all were green as green could be. And that's where we get some rhyme. That's where we do get rhyme. rhyme. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, this is what it sounds like in West Midlands, Middle English. Okay. Uh, now we leave her service, say you no more, for each we may well wit no want that there were, and other noise for noon, I had believe, that the lewd meat have led little or to catch. For an eighth was the noise not a wheel says, and the fierce course in the court keenly served. There has in it the hall door an achlich meister, on the most on the mold on measure he, for the swear to the swang so swart and so thick, and his limbs and his limbs so long and so great, hath attain, attain is giant, attain in air they hope that he were. But mon must I all get min him to ben, and that the murriest in his muckle that might ride, for a back and of breast all were his body stern, both as warm and as washed were worthily small, and all his features fallen in form that he had full clean. For wonder of his human had set in his semblant sin, he fared as freak well had, and over all anchor grain. <laughs> Green. <laughs> well, thank you for that. That was amazing. Uh, he says, the poet is so amazing because he waits till the last word to tell you, oh, by the way, you know, everybody was amazed, everybody was amazed, and, you know, the amazed us. he was all over green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 